Hi, this is Nicole Kupchik and welcome to 10 Minute Tidbits. Today, I'm here with Joel Green, and we are going to chat about the new PADIS guidelines. So you might be like, what's PADIS? Yeah. What are the PADIS yes. guidelines? So anyway, so it's the new delirium guidelines for pain, agitation, delirium, immobility, immobility and sleep. Yeah, so anyway, so they were published late fall, and it was a follow-up to the 2013 guidelines that were published. It was actually the very first guidelines that were ever published on delirium. And so anyway, so what we want to do is, this would be a two-part uh, show, is we want to go through what the guidelines revealed and to kind of give you some direction. So why don't we just start at the top? Yeah, so with pain, um, that's the easiest one. That They're making a lot of recommendations about changing how we assess pain, how we're medicating pain, and how we're treating it overall. Yeah, and one of the um, kind of big things that I would say that's new is there's this whole idea of what they're calling anglo-sedation or analogo-sedation. You might hear it pronounced uh, either way, but um, I call I pronounce it analogo-sedation. But the whole idea of using an opioid medication to provide analgesic, but also sedation in, right. in patients. And I think that would be more for the intubated patient. Right. I don't, what, do, what do you think? There has been a movement. Uh, SCCM, which is Society of Critical Care Medicine, a few years ago was talking about how if we can just sedate patients with just, say, fentanyl, instead of using yeah. propofol and using um, benzodiazepines and other agents, patients can be more awake and more engaged in the plan of care yeah. um, to better help them with delirium was one of their goals. Yeah, and I, I don't know, I have some, I definitely have some mixed feelings about this. I think we need a bit more data to see mm -hmm. if this is the right thing to do. Um, I, I think we're pretty clear that we should be backing off the benzos except yeah. for certain situations like seizures or alcohol withdrawal. But, um, but I, I, you know, I don't know, like I've, I've been around for a long time. I've been doing this for 26 years now. And one of the things I don't want us to end up going back to are big, huge infusions right. of opioids that people just don't turn down because the patient looks okay. Like 200 mics of fentanyl an hour? Oh, I've yeah. seen way yeah. higher doses than that. I mean, I don't know what's the right. highest dose you've ever seen. Uh, 350, I think, is the highest on fentanyl I've ever seen. And I'll be but, honest, I've seen 500 yeah. of fentanyl an hour, yeah. which is, like... You have to wonder at some point, like if you've got a patient who needs up to 500 of fentanyl an hour, you know, is there something we're missing? Right. You know, is that opioid yeah. really giving the appropriate... Or are they getting refractory effects right. from it? Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, I think some other ideas we really should start thinking a bit more about is a multimodal approach right. to pain management, yeah. right? So, And this is one of the things that orthopedics has always been good about, especially in yes, the surgery environment, is they will give patients multimodals before they go to surgery. That way, middle yeah. of surgery, they start working, and by the end of surgery, their patients are reaching like peak onset. So they're giving like a COX-1, they're giving gabapentin, yes. um, they're adding NSAIDs to their profile, depending on what type of surgery they're having. So we're getting a lot more effect from a multimodal approach rather than just giving yeah. high dose opioid, opioid, opioid. I completely agree. And I think, you know, I, for a while, um, many, many of you may know, I went and uh, ran a bariatric surgery program and, um, I was a little bit shocked when I started running the program that these patients were, I mean, it's endoscopic surgery, but they were put on big gun Dilaudid PCA right. pumps. And, um, I, we really revamped the way we manage pain, but we brought in IV acetaminophen. And it's so funny. So many people are like, Oh, it's so expensive. Right. <laughs> it's, it's actually not that expensive. Yeah. It's like 35, 40 bucks a bottle. And you know, in the max you'd ever use per day is four bottles. Mm -hmm. And you know, we saw a huge difference. Right. We went to IV acetaminophen. And well, and I think that's one of the problems is when you look at pharmacists that, that run the time, I don't know, the, or acetaminophen, they're like, it's acetaminophen, whether it's PR, PO, or IV, it's the same. They patient gets the same effect. It actually isn't the but same. But when we see nurses actually yeah. will say, you can see clinically difference in our patients and how they feel. So it's more of a subjective and objective as yeah. we look at it. Pharmacy looks at it one way and nursing and physicians look at it another way and how the patients actually feel when they receive the drug. Yeah, and let me ask you this, which, which one, IV, oral, rectal, crosses the blood-brain barrier? The IV exactly. Yeah. The others don't. And so you cannot put them in the same category. Like, would you ever compare, you know, like, let's say 
oral morphine to IV morphine? Mm -hmm. I'm going to guess probably not, right. right? You know, I don't know. I just, it's one of those things that just drives me insane. It's like the pharmacy cost, but yet it's like, you know, if you try some of these things, the overall mm -hmm. hospital cost actually decrease. Yeah. So. And we see a lot of movement like in our targeted temperature management protocols where they've added the IV acetaminophen just because uh, for shivering yeah. and for pain for these types of patients that can't respond and show us different types of pain scoring because they're a neuromuscular blockade. Yeah, no, absolutely. So anyway, so yeah, um, other things, but I love how you mentioned um, like uh, Neurontin, mm. gabapentin, and those are absolutely right. some options, especially if you've got somebody who's got neuropathic pain, at, for sure, mm. uh, it would be a nice option. Um, but NSAIDs, you know, but the thing you got to really worry about with NSAIDs are renal function right. and age. You know, Age, yeah. yeah, it's a big one, right? You know, yeah, so there are some black boxes with the NSAIDs, and then we have our surgeons who are always like, no, it causes bleeding. Um, it's very minimal risk, unless patients are already at high risk for bleeding. Um, you know, so we see the physicians that are like, I don't yeah. want my patients getting them, but they do provide a lot of relief for our patients, especially um, the guidelines talk a lot about nefapam, which is not something we see here on the West Coast very often. Well, it's uh, not FDA approved in the US. They, yeah, it, not that I know of. I don't so, think it's FDA yeah. approved in the U.S., yeah. So but it's, like, it's big in Europe, Yeah, it's right? a huge drug in Europe, so we hopefully will be seeing it soon, but right now it's not something we see, yeah. but the SECM talks a lot about adding that to your program. Do you have any experience with it at all? No. Yeah, I have none, yeah. so um, I w don't even know what yeah. to say about it. So I have experience with Neurontin, personally, and I can say that it was after I herniated a disc in my neck, it was the most tired I've ever been in my life. Yes, they there's a lot of side effects to 900, it, right? 900, three times a day, and I, I couldn't function, um, so I actually had to back down. <laughs> oh, man. Um, but yeah, it actually works really well um, for patients. Like, I stopped taking opioids because my nerve pain was gone. Because so. you were so sleepy. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> I'm joking, I'm totally joking. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah, so you it does work. Yes. And whatever, you know. Um, and it's a fairly cheap medication, too, yeah. because it's been, you know, not a lot of people have been using it. I have a feeling someone's going to buy it and crank the price up. Oh, yeah, yeah as, as things go, right? Yeah. Okay. But anyway, so that's the, the P is pain. Mm -hmm. So the A, agitation. Yeah, agitation. So the biggest thing with agitation is how can we manage a patient to a RAS score less than one, uh, Richmond agitation, sedation score, um, yeah. because once they get above one, then they become unsafe. And that's unsafe to themselves and unsafe to staff. And that's where we have the trouble of like, how do we manage that to get them to where they can still be awake and moving around a little bit, but they're not at risk for harm. Well, and I think it's like the chicken and the egg type thing too, right? Because why do patients get agitated? Because they have delirium. Right. Why do they get delirium? Because of the sedatives we use. Um, so, I, you know, I think it's one of those things we've just got to be really thoughtful about the sedatives mm -hmm. we use. So, really, we should it should be propofol and dexmedetomidine. Right. That, that those should be your agents unless you have an alcohol withdrawal yeah. or, you know, you're having right. seizures. Um, really, gone should be the days of lorazepam, yeah. diazepam, or uh, midazolam infusions, yeah. right? But you know, funny enough, I taught a we taught a vet class uh, last week, and nurse is talking about how right. they're using midazolam infusions. So well, I mean, and we had one just this week where cardiology didn't want propofol because it was a myocardial depressant, and I said, well, the patient crawling out of bed is also a myocardial depressant because their SVO2 is 20 now uh, from using <laughs> yeah. up all their oxygen. So I said it's kind of a, you know, pick your poison here. Um, and I think, too, along that same thing is what medications are we using, but also are we assessing what's causing their agitation? Yeah. Sometimes it's they feel like they have to pee or they have to have a bowel movement or they have to cough yeah. or the restraints or whatever it is, Some or they're hot or they're cold. Sometimes it's little things that cause them to be agitated that yeah. are that are environmental things that aren't necessarily things we need to medicate. Well, and you kind of wonder if some, like, like would that be the patient that you just described that would benefit from an analogo right. station, yeah. right? So, I mean, that, that maybe that would be the patient. Right. Decrease oxygen demand, mm -hmm. have some sedative effect, give you know, provide right. analgesic. And I think it know. depends a also on your patient population because some of our patient yeah. populations can handle things like analgo sedation. Other of our patients who use illicit substances on a frequent basis may not be the criteria for those types of sedation. Regimes. Yeah, well, I mean, you definitely work yeah. in an area that's I would say yeah. different than at a county a trauma of facility. Yeah. You see a lot different yeah. patient population <laughs> yeah. than say work at a private pay, yeah. um, elite hospital kind of thing. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. but uh, but yeah, and I th you know again, I think your point was really good too about just getting down to the 
foundation of why is this patient agitated. Yeah. Okay. All right. The D is delirium. So the D in pad is, is delirium. Yeah. You know, interesting. It's, uh, you know, I, I, when prevalence studies, you look at the literature and, and evaluate prevalence studies, it is over 50% mm -hmm. in ICU patients. Yeah. That is insane. So there's two different types of delirium. Hyperactive. So you've all seen that, yeah. right? Hyperactive. Pulling things out, trying to get out of bed. Yeah. You know, the patient that you're worried about, right. you know, fall risk. Get out of my house. This is not my car. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, and then there's hypoactive, which, you know, these are just dreamy patients right. to take care of, right? The little lady in room 12 who's like, you don't yeah. want to ask you for a thing, but right. she not know what planet she's on. Yeah. So do, do you know... Here's a little trivia for you. Which one's more common, hyper or hypoactive? I would say probably the hypoactive because it, it goes exactly. underdiagnosed. Yeah, and they it's estimated that about 80% of cases are actually hypoactive mm -hmm. delirium. Um, so, and I think you're totally right in that they go under-recognized right. Often the hyperactive is pretty easy yeah. to identify, you know, but um, but hypoactive is challenging. Yeah. So, all right. So, what are you doing at the bedside to identify? Um, so we're doing the save a heart delirium. So cam. And cam scoring. Okay. So you know, can you tell me when I say the letter A? Yeah. Um, the Which assesses inattention. Uh, there's the questionnaire things like can a rock float on water and those kind of yeah. questions that do it, and then just your daily orientation, you know. Where are you? What day is it? Yeah. What month is it? What kind of building is this? Those kind of questions. Yeah, and, and that's the key thing to understand about delirium is there's two key clinical uh, indicators that differentiate delirium from other things, and that's inattention and disorganized thinking. So we'll ask the patient, we'll spell out 10 letters, and four of them need to be an A. So we usually use save a heart. So, it's, so you have to squeeze your hand when they hear the letter A. So it's S A V. A -V. E A H A A A R T, R -T. Yeah. and you know it's so funny because so, I have done so much work in um, delirium assessments uh, and really educating staff and you'll see patients you ever have somebody go eh, eh, yeah they squeeze with every single letter <laughs> you know? yeah. and it's so funny so many nurses call that unable to assess right. That's not unable to no, assess. That's delirious. That's delirium, yeah. right? Yeah. And then the other one is when you've got somebody who's just like you're saying the letters and like huh. Yeah, you know, which like, could be the hypoactive delirium. That is yeah. hypoactive delirium, right? Yeah. You know, and so anyway, but I think um, we were noticing, like when we first rolled out a lot of the delirium assessments, that nurses were really hesitant to document CAM positive. Right. And what what's your hesitation is what I want to know. Like, why would you hesitate? What's the downside? There really isn't one that I've yeah. seen. I'm like, this is my assessment. They're delirious. They're not delirious. But yeah, yeah and I think... Um, just because they didn't know if they marked positive, what they had to do. So I marked positive. Now what do I do? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's I think that's a great thing to ask. What do you do? And you know, really, it's basics. You yeah. give them their glasses, give them their right. hearing aids, get them out of Dentures, bed. Dentures, get them out of bed. Day nine orientation. Yeah. This what else? Meal time. Yeah. yeah. Like if there's benzos, ask, can you get rid of them? And really, it's looking at their med list. That's where pharmacists are key, yeah. is looking at their med list to see what can we get rid of. Yeah. Okay. Um, anything else about delirium? I, the one thing I'm going to say, though, asking what day is it, what mm -hmm. time is it, what yeah. year is it, that does not assess delirium. No. You've got to dig deeper. Right. And um, one of the questions on the CAM is, um, do fish swim in the sea? Right. And no joke, a couple of years ago, I had this guy look me dead in the eyes, and he's like, do you mean elephants? Yeah. And I'm like, no. No. I mean fish. Fish. fish and yeah and it was just he just couldn't put the thoughts right. together and then the one, one I love is does a stone float on water yeah. well pumice does like okay smart but you're right. totally fine so yeah, anyway, yeah you're fine yes so anyway, anyway. yeah so some of our patients will see that this kind of if they're awake and they're not delirious they don't know why we're doing these tests but if you are delirious, it definitely proves positive the second you start into the test. Yeah, so anyway. Uh, but we wanted to kind of, so this is the first part of a two-part uh, episode where we wanted to go over the new PAD-IS guidelines and just highlight kind of uh, just things we should be incorporating at the bedside. So, all right. Well, I'm Nicole Kupchak. And I'm Joel Green. And this is 10-Minute Tidbits.